This video is about serial correlation and heteroscedasticity in time series regressions. Where are we in the course? We have talked about heteroscedasticity, um, that was uh, chapter 8 in Woldridge's book. Then we have talked about time series analysis in an introductory way um, and in the way it is covered in chapter 10 of Woolrich's book. And now we're going to um, dig a little bit deeper and talk about the content of chapter 12 in Woolrich's book. And we're also going to have a little intermezzo from chapter 11, and that is about asymptotic properties of OLS. Thereafter, we're going to talk about properties of OLS with serially correlated errors. So one of the assumptions we have made up to now will be violated or will not hold. And we will think about um, what that means for the properties of our OLS estimator. Thereafter, we're going to talk about testing for serial correlation. After that, we talk about uh, ways in which we can correct, one way in which we can correct for serial correlation in order to uh, obtain efficient estimates. And in the very end, we talk about serial correlation robust inference after OLS. Now, um, chapter 11 um, is um, not going to feature very prominently here. Um, I'm just going to uh, summarize a little bit what's going on there. Um, I, in chapter 11, asymptotic properties of OLS are studied. Um, in the uh, time series context. Um, so what you see here is a set of assumptions, TS1 prime up to TS5 prime, that correspond to the assumptions we have seen before in chapter 10. Um, these were TS1 up to uh, TS5. Um, and uh, these assumptions uh, are important for deriving asymptotic properties of the OLS estimator. Let's look at them in some more detail. TS1 prime is linearity and weak dependence. So um, the specification of the model is the exact same as before in TS1, and that was just our linear model. Um, but the difference now is that um, we assume that process to be so-called stationary and weakly dependent. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about this in much detail, but stationarity means that um, probability distributions don't depend on the time and weak dependence um, you can think of as um, a not too strong correlation over time. And I'll leave it at that. Um, the second assumption, TS2 prime, is the exact same assumption as before, and that is um, no perfect collinearity. And that is an assumption we have also made in the cross-sectional context. We simply need it in order to um, get estimates um, of all of our coefficients. So when we have perfect collinearity, then um, the data are not going to tell us um, uh, you know, uh, whether something can be attributed to one coefficient or another. Then there is assumption TS3 prime. That assumption uh, corresponds to assumption three we had before and also the zero conditional mean assumption we have seen in the cross-sectional context. So now um, we're not gonna um, condition here on this uh, fat um, letter X anymore. So we're not gonna have strict exogeneity, but we're gonna have contemporaneous exogeneity. So that means that the um, error term UT in period T is mean independent of the axis in period t. That is enough. We don't need more uh, to derive asymptotic properties. Then there is assumption TS4 prime, that is homoscedasticity. We had that before as well uh, in TS4, um, with the difference that the conditioning set um, had uh, all the x's in all time periods in it, um, but the notation is the same, so it's sigma square for the variance of the ut. And finally, we have assumption TS5 prime, 
and that is no serial correlation. How do we express that here? We condition on excess in two time periods, T and S, two different time periods. And then we say that the expectation of the two error terms in those two time periods, the product of those two error terms conditional on these x's is equal to zero. That's our set of assumptions um, that uh, we need for the asymptotics. Um, all this is uh, discussed in great detail in chapter 11. Here I'm going to state uh, some results uh, that are developed and discussed uh, in chapter 11. First result is theorem 11.1, .1, that is consistency of OLS. And you can already guess, um, as before, um, uh, a part of these assumptions is enough um, to establish consistency. So before we have talked about unbiasedness, now asymptotically we talk about consistency. And for consistency, what we need is um, assumption one prime, two prime, and three prime. So linearity, uh, no perfect multicollinearity, and zero conditional mean. Under these um, assumptions, the OLS estimators are going to be consistent. Then there is theorem 11.2 um, that establishes asymptotic normality of OLS. For that, we need two additional assumptions. One is homoscedasticity, and the other assumption is a zero um, serial correlation assumption. That's assumption number five prime. And under these five assumptions, the OLS estimators are going to be asymptotically normally distributed. Furthermore, the usual OLS standard errors, T stats and F stats are going to be asymptotically valid. For all this, what is really key is uh, weak dependence. Um, so, and that was assumption TS1 prime. Um, so weak dependence, as I said before, means that the, da that the data are not too correlated over time. So um, between two time periods uh, that lie um, some periods apart, there should be um, a, weak, uh, a weak correlation. Now, uh, one way um, to uh, also grasp this a little bit more um, is to think about um, the opposite case. The opposite case that is also described actually uh, in chapter 11 is highly persistent or uh, strongly dependent um, data. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, on the, on the, uh, uh, when, when this is the case, um, these asymptotic results do not apply. Um, but, and we're going to see an, an example uh, for a highly persistent data uh, in a minute. Um, however, and that is kind of interesting, um, the finite sample results uh, that we have seen in chapter 10 um, do still apply. Now, what is going on here? Um, what is going on is that asymptotic analysis is very different conceptually from uh, the finite sample um, analysis that we do in chapter 10. Um, so that explains this. Um, in chapter 10, we, um, we derive um, uh, um, the variance of our estimator that we need uh, to get standard errors, t-stats and f-stats, but um, in a finite sample, say, mindset. Um, here um, in chapter 11, um, this is all about asymptotic, um, uh, asymptotic results. And um, asymptotic results um, always involve some thought experiment that uh, the amount of data is growing uh, more and more and more. And then in the limit, you get some results and then you take those results and um, use them uh, in order to assess finite sample uh, properties of your estimator. So there's this additional step um, in the middle, um, which, which involves going uh, to infinity. Um, and uh, when you go to infinity and certain assumptions don't hold, um, then something goes wrong. That would be. Um, one way of uh, describing an intuition uh, for why this is actually true. Now, um, <clears throat> here's, an, here's an example of uh, highly persistent uh, data. Um, so these are two realizations of a so-called random walk. And what you see here is what a random walk is. So a random walk uh, would be um, uh, the following uh, model, yt, 
is equal to yt minus 1 plus et. Okay, and in the beginning you would have an initial condition, for instance, that y in period 0 would be equal to 0. And then if you assume, for instance, normality for et, um, so standard normal distribution, and you uh, let that run um, for 50 periods, uh, then you get a process that looks like this. Okay, a realization of a process that looks like this. You run it again, and it's going to look like this. Okay, this does beg the question, you know, how can I, how can I really detect uh, whether I'm dealing uh, with highly persistent data? Again, um, I, I want to refer you here to the book. Um, all I want to say really is um, that um, one example that has been uh, deemed uh, highly persistent is the US um, T-bill rate. So that is the interest rate on uh, government bonds, basically short-term government bonds. Um, and people have looked at this and they have uh, come down on the conclusion that this is actually a highly persistent process. Um, yeah, um, and I would say by simply eyeballing it, um, there's not much uh, you can see, but there are other ways in which you can actually test that. Um, in which you can easily assess that. In order to properly assess that, you have to do uh, a little bit more. Uh, all this is described in the book in chapter 11 and then later um, in chapter 18. So, but this is an example. Interestingly, these days um, the T bill rate uh, is uh, slightly above zero, so much lower than uh, it was um, 1996, which is the end um, of the time interval captured here. Now, uh, this was um, already uh, the intermezzo uh, from uh, chapter 11. Um, you should be aware of those asymptotic results, but there's no way um, we can um, explain them to you in much more detail, um, in more detail in this course. Now, the next topic is properties of OLS with serially correlated errors. So for a moment, um, think about it. What, what's gonna happen to our OLS estimator if suddenly uh, assumption uh, number five, which is no serial correlation, does actually not hold anymore. And uh, think again about um, unbiasedness and uh, consistency and which assumptions um, these two uh, properties actually require. And when you uh, then do that, then you realize quickly, I think, uh, that unbiasedness and consistency are actually not affected. And so when TS1 up to TS3 hold, um, then we still have unbiased estimators under um, serial uh, correlation of the errors. And um, if TS1 prime up to TS3 prime hold, then again, um, we're going to get consistent estimates um, under serial correlation. So if we really only care about unbiasedness or consistency, um, then um, we're good. If we care about getting uh, correct standard errors and um, uh, so inference, and if we care about efficiency, uh, then we have to, however, um, think a little bit more about it, and we have to actually um, we have to actually fix something. So let's walk through that, uh, what's actually then going on. So assume that um, the first four assumptions hold. And these are the classical assumptions from uh, chapter 10, simply uh, to uh, start with the easiest case. Okay, like in the book, um, many, many cases are discussed. Um, uh, and um, I advise you to read up in the book um, uh, about the details, but uh, for the general uh, argument or for, for the general insight, um, it's enough to study this uh, easiest case. Now assume that um, these four assumptions do hold. The fifth assumption is um, uh, no serial correlation, so that one does not hold. There is serial correlation, so we have a linear model that looks like this. And this is really just for simplicity, we assume that the mean of xt is um, zero, or the average of xt in our sample is zero. Here is um, zero co serial correlation. 
first order zero correlation, so ut is going to be equal to rho times ut minus 1 plus et. And the absolute value of rho is going to be less than 1, so we're going to have stability, and et is going to be serially uncorrelated. So uh, the covariance between et and es in some other period s is going to be 0. What are the consequences? Well, first consequence, OLS is not going to be the best linear unbiased estimator anymore. And here you can argue very mechanically. You can basically say that the proof of um, uh, the blue property does involve assumption number five. Uh, so if assumption number five does not hold, so when I have zero correlation, um, and basically uh, rho is not equal to zero, then uh, the blue property does not hold anymore. Furthermore, um, the OLS standard errors are going to be invalid. So here uh, I would like to show this to you um, for, the for, for, uh, for the first um, coefficient or the slope coefficient. This would be the estimate of beta 1. So beta 1 hat can always be written as the true value plus the total sum of squares um, for x um, uh, times the sum of the x and the u over time. That corresponds directly uh, to the way we have written it in the cross-sectional context. Now, what I would like to do now is to look at the variance of my estimator um, beta 1 hat, conditional, on all the x's. So um, the variance of beta 1, beta 1 is a constant, this is going to drop out. So it's going to be the variance of that uh, term here. And as before, I can pull out this total sum of squares um, for x inverse. Um, so I'm just going to square it to pull it out. So it's going to move in front of the variance. So I'm going to have the variance of that term here again, conditional on x. Now the question is, how can, I, how can I write that out? So before, what we got was that the x u term, so the sum, um, the uh, elements of that sum, they were not correlated over time, or they were not correlated in the cross-sectional context uh, across individuals. So that meant that uh, the variance of the sum was the sum of the variances. And that is um, what is going on here. Um, but when these terms are correlated over time, then we get an additional term, which is this uh, rather complicated looking term. Um, and this additional term uh, means, um, well, um, if you inspect this uh, for the moment, in, it involves a row. Um, and up here, uh, you also have the row. And I told you before that actually serial correlation um, is not there anymore when rho is equal to zero because then ut is just uh, equal to et and et is um, iid over time. It's serially uncorrelated. Um, so actually, um, when rho is equal to zero, everything is fine. We also see that here. When rho is equal to zero, we have these terms rho to the power j, right? Um, and j goes from one to something uh, bigger than one. Um, so then actually, um, this whole business um, is going to be equal to zero. So you see already here that as soon as rho is um, not equal to zero, we're um, getting a different formula for the variance of our estimator of beta one uh, given x. Now, let's think about this for the moment. Um, suppose we use the um, usual uh, uh, estimator for the variance. So then we're just going to calculate this part here. If we do that, um, then um, we say, you know, the variance is two uh, and, and we're ignoring this part here. So the question is, do we over or underestimate the variance? Um, and in Woolrich's book, it's explained uh, very nicely that most likely we're going to underestimate um, the variance of beta 1 hat. And the reason for that is that um, rho is usually positive and usually these two x's 
are positively correlated with one another. So that product here is also going to be something positive uh, uh, usually. And if, if that is the case, um, then we have here something positive. This is also something positive. And then we have a double sum over um, also something positive. So we're taking it uh, as this and we're ignoring that part and that second part is something positive. So we're underestimating uh, the variance of our estimator. And that's bad because um, that means that sometimes we would conclude that um, uh, our estimates are significantly different from zero, whereas actually um, they might not be, right? Um, because we base that conclusion on a wrong estimator of the variance of beta one hat, um, an estimate that is too small. So that's the risk. Now, um, what I want to do next is to actually inspect this term here a little bit um, more to understand uh, what this formula actually means. And for this, I'm going to switch to my document camera. So what we do have is um, the variance of beta one hat given x. And that was written as sigma square divided by the total sum of uh, squares for x. And here, um, you know, uh, keep in mind that we have used um, also that um, x is on average zero. This is just kind of simplify the notation from now on, uh, plus two times sigma square SST x squared and then we have a sum here t is equal to 1 up to n minus 1 and here j is equal to 1 up to n minus t and then I have rho uh, j rho to the power j x t x t plus j. Okay, uh, so what I want to do now is to think about what that um, double sum actually is. Um, and here uh, notice that there is a 2 and then here there's the same uh, sigma square and here I have like uh, the total sum of x's squared but um, that was there here as well. But then I had also the sum and uh, it was there once in the numerator. So one, one of them canceled away. So basically uh, before this, one of those two canceled away with uh, uh, some, some of the x square business here. Now, um, let's think about what this one here is. And I'm not gonna fully derive this, but it will be actually enough um, to look at this for a little bit. So what I'm doing is here, I'm going um, over all the periods. So I'm starting at period one and I'm ending up in the second to last period. So N is the last period. Okay, and when I'm in period one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a second counter. That's gonna be my J and J is gonna be going from one up to N minus T. So, um, uh, what does that mean? Um, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm in period, t is equal to 5 and n is equal to 11. Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from t is equal to um, 5. Uh, no, then, sorry. Then I'm going to go from g is, j is equal to 1 up to uh, 11 minus 5. Okay. Um, 11 minus 5 is 6. Okay. And um, what we see here is from 5 to 11, it's exactly 6 periods. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to go um, 6 periods into the future. I'm going to start in period 5. And what, I, what this j is going to do is going to go six periods into the future. 
Um, so here I have rho to the power j, x, 5, um, and here I have x, 5 plus j. So what I'm looking at is covariances between these x's in the end of the day, or interaction terms between these x's, and I'm starting in 5, and I'm going into the future up to uh, the last period, because um, when j is equal to 6, it's going to be 5 plus 6, it's going to be 11, so there's going to be the last x. So let's write that out. Then I'm going to get for t is equal to 5 as the starting point, um, and I'm going to start with j is equal to 1. I have rho to the power 1 x 5 x 6 plus rho to the power 2 x 5 x 7 plus rho to the power 3 x 5 x 8 and so on and so forth up to rho to the power 6 x 5 x 11. Okay? Now, um, what is this doing now? When you look at, for instance, this one here, from 5 to 8. What is this actually cap uh, capturing? Well, um, this is um, multiplied by sigma square up here. Okay? Um, so sigma square times rho 3 x 5 x 8 turns out to be equal to the covariance between u5 and u8. How can we see that? Well, uh, because that covariance between these two is going to be the covariance between u5 and let's write u8 as rho to the power 3, aha, rho to the power 3 times u5 um, and now I need to um, put in all the e's that play a role as well. So that would be plus rho to the power 2 times e6 plus rho times e7 um, plus e8. That here is just another way to write u8. Now, um, these e's are not correlated with any other e's. Um, so u5 has lots of e's in it, um, but not e6, not e7, and not e8. So therefore, the covariance between u5 and same here, the covariance between u5 and this and this and this is going to be zero. So what you get is um, that this is equal to rho to the power 3 times the covariance of u5 and u5, and that is rho to the power 3 times, now well, the covariance between u5 and u5 is the variance of u5, and that will be sigma square. Now, let's look at this formula here. Um, sigma square rho to the power 3 x5 x8. Well, um, what have I missed? I have missed the x business. Um, so I have to now uh, include the x business as well. Where does the x business come into play? The x business is multiplying um, the u's. 
So um, this covariance is this. So if I now, um, so what is actually true is this statement here. This is true, like this. And um, if I now multiply, so this one here is true. And if I now multiply the um, u5 with x5 and the u8 with x8, then what I'm getting is x5, x8, sigma square, rho to the power 3. Okay, so what am I showing you here? I'm showing you here that in the end of the day, um, it's all about covariances. So this business here uh, multiplied with the uh, sigma square is going to be a covariance. Um, where does the two come from? The two comes from the fact um, that um, the variance of A plus B is the variance of A plus the variance of B plus two times the covariance of A and B. And the more general thing that is going on here is that when you have a big variance covariance matrix, so uh, let's say uh, for the U's, that looks like this. So that would be the variance of U1. This would be the covariance of um, U1 and U2. Tup, 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 up to the covariance of U1 and Un. And then here you would have the variance of u2. On the diagonal, it goes up to the variance of un. Here you have the covariance between u2 and u1. Here you have the covariance between u3 and u1. Da 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 da. Covariance between un and u1 and so on and so forth, then um, what you have, and that is a result that I'm not going to prove, but it's relatively easy for you to actually verify that if you sit down and uh, just use the definition of um, a variance, then you have that the variance of u1 plus u2 plus, bu -bu 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 plus un is going to be equal to the sum of all these elements. Okay, um, so um, you know already that it's equal to the sum of the variances if all these covariances are zero. Then the, the variance of the sum is um, the sum of the variances. If these covariances are not equal to zero, then all you have is really um, that it's, it's the sum of all these elements. And now where does the two come from? Well, the covariance between u2 and u1 is equal to the covariance between u1 and u2. So these two are equal, huh? and then whatever, the covariance between un and u1 is equal to the covariance between un, u1 and un. So all you have to do um, when you want to figure out uh, what, the, what the variance of a sum is, or you can write the variance of a sum as the diagonal elements, plus two times the off diagonals, either above or below the diagonal. And that is exactly what is actually going on here. So this one here is um, writing out um, the diagonal element. Oh, I'm sorry. This one here is using the diagonal elements and that is exactly the same formula as we had uh, before uh, for the cross-sectional case or for the time series case without serial correlation, then we only have the diagonal elements and then we get the standard 
OLS um, expression that we have seen before. And what is um, added here is two times um, one of those triangles. And this is, this is writing out one of those triangles. And then again, what I've done here is I've looked at this triangle a little bit more. Um, so um, what you see here is this double sum. So what you do is you start in one time period and then you always go only into the future. Okay, so you start in t is equal to one, you go up to the second to last, uh, and, and this is how you go into the future. So, um, so in fact, what is, what is used here is you start in time period one, and then uh, the double sum is actually um, calculating this triangle here. So here you go into the future. So you go one, two, da, 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 n minus one periods into the future up to period n. And that's exactly what you get. And the covariance between u1 and un would be, as I told you, would be, well, this is u1 and un. So this is n minus one periods into the future. Um, so it's rho to the power n minus one times the um, uh, covariance between u1 and u1, and that would be the variance of u1, and that would be sigma square. So this gives you a little bit of um, background and intuition uh, for this formula here. Um, this derivation is not very deep, but I find it always important to at least um, have an intuition for where it comes from. I don't um, want you to memorize this, but I want you to understand what is going on here and that it's not rocket science. Good. This brings me already to the next topic, which is testing for serial correlation. So um, what we've seen now is that for consistency and unbiasedness, um, it does not really matter whether you have serial correlation, but it does matter for inference and it does matter for efficiency of your estimator. So um, maybe you don't care about um, efficiency of the estimator all that much. And this is what I'm going to argue, the modern way to do econometrics, but um, you should care about inference, about getting the right standard errors. Um, so in order to get uh, the right standard errors, we're, not, we're gonna need uh, some correction. No, we're, we're, we're gonna need a, the correction is for um, efficiency. In order to get the right standard errors, we need a correlation robust inference. That is the very last point I'm gonna talk about. Um, but if you care about, you know, first uh, learning whether there's zero correlation, so whether you should actually correct for it in order to get more efficient estimates, if you care for that, then um, you need to know how you can test for serial correlation. And um, that is actually uh, anyway instructive uh, to look into this because it teaches you a little something about the model. Now, um, we have a static model here. The static model is that y in t um, is beta naught plus beta one xt plus ut. So it's static because it depends, yt depends on xt. Uh, now we have autocorrelation in the UT um, and we have uh, autocorrelation of uh, order one in the simplest possible case, which looks like this. So UT is rho times UT minus one plus ET. Now this model can be written uh, in the following way. And again, these ETs are going to be the same ETs as before, and they're going to be serially uncorrelated. So the correlation of ET and ES for two time periods S and T um, is going to be zero. Now let's, um, let's rewrite that um, first and then see uh, where we get from there. So I want to start um, by writing down what we actually have for period T minus one. So if I just take the model that I had, then I have that yt minus one is gonna be beta naught plus beta one 
x t minus 1 plus u t minus 1. All I'm doing is I'm writing the model here um, using t minus 1 instead of t for the time. Uh, what that means is I can just write u t minus 1 as y t minus 1 minus beta naught minus beta 1 x t minus 1. Why is that interesting? Well, it is interesting because this is data, this you can estimate, this you can estimate, and this is data. So u t minus 1 is potentially something you can estimate. Now, let's write down the model for t. That is simply the model that was on the slide. Beta 1 x t plus u t. And, well, u t is equal to rho u t minus 1 plus e t. And what that means is I'm going to be able uh, to write the model in the way it was on the slide, or I can actually um, already do a little transformation and write it like this. So I can write um, yt minus beta naught minus beta 1 xt yt minus beta naught minus beta 1 xt is equal to and here I have rho ut minus 1 plus et so um, it's going to be rho and ut minus 1 is this so I'm going to have yt minus 1 minus beta naught minus beta 1 xt minus 1 plus um, et. So what this tells us is that there is hope uh, that we can estimate this data estimate estimate data and regress it on that data estimate estimate data why is there hope well um, the et is a very well behaved error term the et is serially uncorrelated so i can use a very standard regression and i can use the usual standard errors uh, that come with it because et is going to be a very well behaved error term it's going to be iid it's not going to be serially correlated um, and what i'm going to estimate is this coefficient rho so what i want to do is i want to test whether rho is different from zero and if rho is different from zero then um, i know that there is serial correlation and this is what is going on this is what is going on uh, in the bottom part of this slide so i'm going to do a t-test for first order autocorrelation um, when there's strict exogeneity um, the null hypothesis is going to be that rho is equal to zero i'm going to estimate this model here so ut well i'm going to replace the ut by the residual and i'm going to regress the residual on the residual in the previous period where do I get those residuals from? I just run OLS. These residuals are going to be consistently estimated because I'm going to get consistent estimates uh, of beta naught and beta 1. Um, then I'm going to get this um, estimate rho hat and I'm just going to do the t-test for a zero slope. And all this is just the baseline logic, the baseline idea and it can be extended um, to also allow for covariates that are not strictly exogenous and to also have higher order zero correlation. But um, the uh, general idea is very simple and very intuitive. And it's a test you can do without any extra coding. All you need to do is to use um, the OLS estimator with the usual standard error estimates. Good, this brings, brings us to correction, 
to correcting for serial correlation. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, um, for the same reason as you would want to um, do uh, a correction for heteroscedasticity in the cross-sectional context. And actually it turns out um, that one can also correct for heteroscedasticity in the time series context, but we're not going to um, get into that. Um, how are we going to look at that? Well, let's assume that assumption one up to four from chapter 10 hold, um, and that the model is the simple model with just one explanatory variable. And the one difference uh, to what we had before is serial correlation of order one, uh, order correlation of order one in the error term, and we have stability. If you care about what that is, uh, read up in chapter 11. So um, our row is going to be uh, less than one in absolute value. And the ETs are going to be serially uncorrelated. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to find a way so that we can transform the data as we did when we looked at um, uh, correcting for heteroscedasticity so that the transformed data does um, uh, fulfill the classical assumptions and that would mean here no autocorrelation. So what we need to do is we need to take the autocorrelation away and then we estimate um, the parameters that interest us, beta naught and beta one, using the transformed data. How do we do that? Well, it's easiest to see it when I again write out things. So the whole trouble arises because ut is equal to rho times ut minus one plus et. So how can we uh, go about this? If we would, so this is our error term, right? So if we would be able to only have et as our error term, then that would be great because et is not correlated over time and then we're going to be good. So um, what that suggests is that my transformation is going to be very simple. Uh, for uh, the error term, what I want to do is I want to subtract rho times the uh, observation in the previous period. Then I'm going to have et. And let's call this uh, u tilde. And that's already it. So all we need to do then is to do the same thing um, also for uh, the rest of our data. So we're going to have y tilde. And that's going to be yt minus rho times yt minus 1. We're going to have xt. And that's going to be xt xt tilde, it's going to be xt minus rho times xt minus 1. And then we're going to estimate the model y tilde t is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 um, x tilde t plus u tilde t. How do we know that this is the right model? Well, what we do is we actually uh, start from this equation here and we plug in our functional form for yt that is um, on top of the slide, beta naught plus beta one xt plus ut, and then we get to this one here. So that's great. Um, so uh, for heteroscedasticity, remember that we first did this um, for the artificial case in which we know actually what rho is, which we normally don't. Uh, so later we're going to uh, make this feasible by replacing uh, rho uh, with an estimate of rho. Um, and we already know how we can get an estimate. All we have to do is we have to um, regress the residuals in the first stage um, on the residuals um, in the previous period, and then we get an estimate of rho. Now, um, 
This can be done for all periods from 2 up to n. Because for all periods from 2 up to n, you, um, you will have um, a previous period and you can subtract um, the previous period from the current period. If you want to be really efficient, what you do have to do is to also use the very first period for which you have data. Now for that very first period, there is no previous period that we can subtract from it. But actually what we can do is a little trick. We can do a different transformation to the very first period. And um, the way this works is um, like this. So first of all, uh, observe that for the transformed data, um, the uh, variance of the error term is going to be the variance of E. Okay, so the transformed data is, is the variance of E. So what we need to do is um, we need to transform the first observation such that the variance of the first observation's error term is equal to the variance of um, ET, which is going to be uh, there in all the future periods observations. Uh, and, and again, the future periods observations are uh, these transformed data. So let's, let's look into this. First of all, mm, we're going to have that UT is equal to rho times ut minus 1 plus et. When I uh, write down what the variance of ut is, then I get that it's, well, these two things are not correlated with one another, so it's going to be the sum of the two variances. And the variance of rho times ut minus 1 is going to be rho square, because I'm pulling it out, it's a constant, times the variance of ut minus 1 plus then the variance of et. This thing here is the variance of the error term for all the other observations. Okay, And for the first observation, this whole thing is the variance. So therefore, I'm looking at this. Now, um, we have assumed homoscedasticity. So homoscedasticity means that this variance here is equal to that variance here. And that was sigma square. Sigma square. So what I can do is I can bring all this business to the left-hand side. So uh, I have that... Um, sigma square minus rho square sigma square is equal to the variance of E t. So we're already basically there. So this I can write as 1 minus sigma, uh, rho square times sigma square. So um, what I need to do is I need to multiply um, the, uh, the observation, the first observation, um, by the square root of this thing here. So let's, let's verify that. Um, so if I take for the transformation of the very first observation the following, I multiply it by the square root of 1 minus rho square, then um, I'm going to have the error term in the first uh, period to be equal to this times u1. So this is going to be my error term for the transformed data for the first period. So let's look at the variance of that thing. It's going to be equal to, well, the square root of 1 minus rho square um, is going to be pulled out. So I need to square it. So I'm going to get 1 minus rho square variance of u1 sigma square, which is exactly this thing here. And this is then going to be equal to the variance of et, and the variance of et 
is the variance of the error term u tilde in all the future periods. And all this is summarized on this slide here. So, again, we assume that the first four assumptions hold. This is our model. This is uh, the serial correlation. This is stability. And we have that ET is serially uncorrelated. This is our data transformation for period two up to N. As I've argued, this removes uh, the serial correlation because all what is left then is ET as the error term. And ET is a very well-behaved error term. Um, we're going to have the data transformation with the tildes. Now, in order to also use the first period, um, what we need to do is we need to use a different transformation in the first period. So here the transformation is for two equal, uh, t is equal to two up to n. Here the transformation is for the first period. And as I've shown you, what we need to use as the transformation is we need to multiply by the square root of one minus rho square. And this to the power a half is that exact square root. And this answers the y question here. This was generalize these squares and to make that feasible, um, and this is the last bullet point, what we need to do is we need to use an estimate of rho um, instead of the actual rho. And all this um, is attributed to um, four people, Cochrane, Orchard, Praise, and Winston. And it's a fairly classical um, result in time series econometrics. And again, this can be extended to covariates. Um, we don't need uh, strict exogeneity and we also don't need uh, first order uh, serial correlation as an assumption. We can also extend that. So um, one can make that whole thing uh, much more general as an approach. This brings us to the very last topic already, which is serial correlation robust inference uh, for OLS estimates. And this is very much um, uh, paralleling uh, what we talked about before. So for heteroscedasticity, I told you that if you don't care about efficiency, what you can do is you can make sure that you uh, get your inference uh, right by using robust standard errors and the exact same thing um, can be done here. So all you need to do in practice is to actually say, hey, uh, please don't give me the usual order standard errors. Please give me robust standard errors. Uh, these are so sometimes referred to as hack standard errors. Um, so heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation consistent. So two um, uh, birds are killed um, with one stone. And this is um, attributed to New and West. And it's one of the most cited uh, papers in econometrics and um, in economics. Um, and this is a very standard approach. And this brings me already to the end of this chapter. I hope it was all clear. All the best. <laughs>